Merci d'être venu. Merci de rester. Quel pays, quelle femme, quelle histoire, quelle douleur. And this film is painful, not just because of the searing, unimaginable pain of Nadia and thousands like her, but it's also painful to watch. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it asks us an essential question, and perhaps it is the most important question of all to raise at the beginning of a human rights festival in Geneva. Why is it that Nadia Murad had to tell her story and tell it again and again and again? She wanted, she said, for the whole world to know a story that she could not and would not forget. And yet every time I see Nadia, and I do see her often, she always says the same thing. Nobody's doing anything. It's just words. Just a few days ago, Yazda and Amal Clooney put out another press release saying, more has to be done as the caliphate is crumbling and the last town of Baguz is besieged. There's a mass grave with Yazidis. Why are they not being investigated? The film is entitled On Her Shoulders. But it wants to tell us, and this festival tells us, that she wants other shoulders. She wants all of our shoulders. And it's just not Nadia. As Murad Ismail told the refugees, the Yazidis in Greece, there's perhaps one million Yazidis, a total community of one million across the Middle East and beyond. 60 million refugees and 60 million stories. So what we want to do tonight in this panel discussion, and it's not just going to be us on stage, it's all of you who've come here tonight with your questions, with your concerns, and with the emotion of having seen a film like that, is to say, well, why does Nadia Murad have to live a life like this? What are the lessons we can draw from it, and how do we move from here? So I'd like to invite on the stage three defenders of human rights who also carry huge burdens on their shoulders. Please welcome to the stage, Sarita, Tatiana, and also Hadjir. Let me introduce you to my three new friends. Sarita Ashraf, right next to me, is from Trinidad, all the way from Trinidad. Well, not really, actually. She came from Baghdad. <laughs> but she's a citizen of the world. It was, a har I know, a hard film to watch. She's the former chief legal analyst who, f who worked on the UN Commission of Inquiry into Syria. And she researched and drafted the report entitled they came to destroy, which is an investigation into the plight of the Yazidis. Thank you so much for being here. And she's now working, as I mentioned, in, in Baghdad. Tatiana joins us from Kiev. Tatiana Pochonchik, she's the director of the Human Rights Information Center in Ukraine. So she helps to defend human rights activists, she helps to document human rights abuses in Ukraine, including in Crimea and also the region of Donbass. And she's a doer. She wants to get things done to improve human rights. And last but not least, someone who I've known from before, Hajar Shari, who's the co-founder of Together We Build It, which is a Libyan organization dedicated to encouraging the political participation of women and young children. And she came all the way from Tripoli in Libya to be with us today. So give them a warm welcome, Geneva welcome. <laughs> so
So I think we should begin with the question that's on everyone's mind right now. Sarita, the film, your first reaction. Um, I, I find it hard some to watch. Like you, I've um, met and spent time with Nadia many times, and I've seen the toll that it's taken on her uh, and seen her speaking and some of the questions that she's been subjected to. I think that, um, as we were sp speaking about earlier, in situations of genocide and in many situations of mass atrocity, um, women and girls are, are more likely to survive. In the case of Nadia's village in Kocho in Sinjar, when the village was emptied, um, it was the last village um, in, in Sinjar to be emptied by ISIS. And so it represents really the, the last destruction of the Yazidi community that, w that was whole at that time. Um, the men and boys were separated from women and girls, men and older boys, um, taken out of the school in groups um, and executed in, in places around the village. And it's estimated that um, maybe about 600 men and boys, no figures are conclusive as yet, um, were executed. Um, so almost all of the Yazidi women and girls from the villages have lost all their male relatives. Um, 18, 20, 22 male relatives all wiped out, which for the Yazidi women um, in a country, which in a culture which is very patriarchal is, has been quite difficult. Um, so what happens is that the women who survived tend to become the, the voices and the faces of the mass atrocity, mass atrocity in, in the case of Nadia Murad of genocide. Um, and that begins to take a toll. Um, they're there, they're expected, as you see from Nadia Murad, to go out into the public again and again, often for Western audiences, in fact, um, to essentially bleed in public, to speak about the murder of their relatives, uh, the violence against them. Often they are, it focuses on the sexual violence. Nadia Murad, uh, you'll see a lot of times she's described in the cases of being sexually enslaved. Um, but of course, she speaks much more widely about a number of crimes. And so someone turns from being a, a victim and a survivor and they become gradually, or they're termed gradually an activist. And then at some point, when people start seeing them again and again, they become almost a product, they become public property. Um, and so there is an internal grammar to advocacy before the UN and NGOs, and there's also, I think, an internal grammar to telling a story um, through journalism, taking on listeners on an emotional journey. But I think people forget that Nadia Murad is also reliving that emotional journey again and again. At, and she has tremendous strength, but it's come at a, at a great cost to her. And, and, and just finally, just to say that although that she has become in many ways um, almost not a person in the way that she was, it's not the same way, but of course, the experience of having been um, taken to um, as holding site and uh, priced and then sold and then resold, it erases the humanity. And there is some element of erasing her as a person, but I think what she clings on to is that she, she sees herself as a, a voice for her community in particular, but also her community sees her humanity and understands what she is doing for them, and, and they love her for it. And, and the Yazidi women, I think, particularly um, hold Nadia very close in their hearts. So, so I think that's where she's continued to find the strength to go on. Right, so on her shoulders. Tatiana, this was a world far away from your own, and yet there must be some resonance in your own. Just first, your reaction to this film, because I think it's the first time that you saw it. Um, it is always uh, very difficult to talk when you see such films. Um, but it is very close to me, because uh, working as human rights defender in a country, being in a, in a military conflict uh, after revolution, with part of territory being occupied, uh, you go through all of it and you always have to find words how to tell people that they are lovely are not alive anymore then you have to find words when you go to security council how to convince them to act as, and you understand that <laughs> finally it will be blocked anywhere and you have to find words and to say your own government, that people living on the occupied territories, they are not traitors, they are not collaborants, they are victims of the conflict. So I think this is very uh, difficult story for all of us, but uh, having such people as Nadia, Murat, as Malala, and many, uh, many other uh, women and girls throughout the uh, different countries, it shows that uh, this uh, fight uh, against 
impunity fight for justice, this is universal and everything is too interconnected. Did you, did you, could you feel the pain of Nadia having to do it over and over again? And I'm sure you had thought of your other people, even yourself, other, other issues, the same thing, repeating, 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 moments of hope, moments of despair, but just keeping on going. Yes, you, when, you know, when, uh, when I was asked, for example, five years ago, six years ago, I would never imagine that uh, war can come to my country. It's very close, it's Europe. And uh, you are never prepared to something that can, can happen, but you, you just uh, can't help doing it. You just go and do. And then uh, you don't have time, uh, maybe in this crisis, to think. But uh, finally, I think that every one of us feels a uh, very big responsibility on our shoulders. Uh, even if we do not, we are not personally victims, but we work with many of them, uh, we feel it. And, and this is a bit, you know, a devastation of, of uh, also of, of yourself. And then you have to build some protect protection for you. I always think, you know, when, for example, it's a s uh, doctor that makes a cancer surgery, the doctor doesn't cry every time. It you just have to be to work and be cold-blooded, but uh, it might be difficult. Mm, yes, Hajar, for you, the film. Yes, um, I've actually watched the film before. I I just watched it two days ago in my room, and I must say it felt completely different. Um, and I would love to believe that it was like the energy in the room or like the sensation that, you know, everyone was feeling the same thing. I, and I was just reflecting about how important it is to like show something like this in the, pres in the presence of other people because we really need to reflect on such things. But to be completely honest, I mean, I think, I think I'm more angry right now than I was before. Um, it's just so unright to see that she had to go through this. Um, it's just weird, like the thought of it. It's weird, it's ironic that she's talking to people at the UN, she's talking to decision makers, she's talking to politicians, and she still has to convince them. I mean, I would understand if, you know, if she's talking to the general public who has nothing to do with these things, then, then maybe, yes, yeah, she needs to give details, she needs to make it more relevant to the people, but to do this in platforms such as the UN and the parliament and other places, it's, I just think it's, it tells a lot about how wrong the system is. And for me, some of the scenes, it just felt like, you know, um, it's, it's some as if there is this global competition of who has it worse, mm -hmm. and you need to prove that you has it worse than other people for us to hear you, for us to listen to you. Like the thing that was leading up to her addressing the General Assembly. And there was a few questions that she was reflecting on. I, I wrote them down and I, I think that was very horrific where she was saying, you know, there was questions that I shouldn't have been asked. Um, tell me what it's like, how they raped you. Um, did you try to resist? I mean, God for sake. Um, did you tell them no, seriously, <laughs> like, like seriously? Do you think about your family a lot? Um, you are famous now. It's, it's as, as I said, I, I just feel more angrier right now because like Nadia was very concrete. She was very, she was giving like substantial information, you know, like she was, t she was saying, I want them to ask me how to respond, not how you felt. Do you think of your family? Did you say no? I mean, uh. yeah. we talked, we, 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 we talked before, um, and you were mentioning, you know, you, you posed the question, do we have to always keep telling these stories? What about when, whatever it is, whether it's Libyan women or Ukra what's happening in Ukraine or um, another Iraqi story, shouldn't we just begin by saying, what are we gonna do about it? Why do we need to keep the storytelling? And yet it's undeniable, you know, on an evening like this, I'm sure not a single person in this room wasn't moved by this story, that it does have a power 
I, I agree with you 100%, but as I said, I think the audience matters. Um, if you have to tell the story to the general public, I do understand it, and it's very important because at the end of the day, these are global problems that need everyone's solidarity. It's not only on the shoulders of politicians or decision makers, but I just fear, uh, feel it was very unjust that she had to go through this in such platforms, you know, because I assume if she's meeting with someone from the UN, that person should already know that it's wrong. That person doesn't need to know how extreme it was. He or she doesn't need to like feel the suffer, like just see her suffering in front of them for them to move, you know, for them to do something. As I said, I completely agree the importance of telling a story is super powerful. And I mean, it was really great that we were here and we heard her story, but but just think of how many times, like in these uh, rooms with meetings of, of people, as I said, who assumingly they are experts in the field of human rights and, and all of these matters, you know? So like, why does she really need to convince them? Mm. Serena, what do, you th what do you think it is? Or I often say that we live in, th in the best of times and the worst of times. We're living in a time where never has our architecture for tackling human rights been so good. We have human rights tribunals. We have international human rights law that's been codified. We have human rights defenders, both local and inter international. And yet we live in a time of so much impunity and so, many, so much injustice, which is like Nadia says, she will never ever really feel she is worth something until sh she sees them in court. You, work, you worked on the Yazidi issue, uh, and documenting it. What is the problem, do you think? Um, that is a, I'm trying to decide if that question's got a complex answer or a really simple, simple answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, I think it probably has, has both. Um, I think that there is a recognition of um, the crimes. And I think there are probably, I would say, two separate problems. One is clearly a political problem of just trying to move, if you're looking at international tr criminal justice, trying to move it before a court that has jurisdiction. Um, and with all the will in the world, I, I completely agree that there is value to survivors speaking. The way that I think people are drawn into a story is because they understand one person, even if at some point in time they, they can't truly look at the person as a person anymore. That's how, you know, Nadia, the reason that the Yazidis are so well known is partly because of Nadia Murad, but also Farida and Lamia, um, who've come forward to tell their stories. But when it comes to making decisions about where you're gonna find justice at an international level, it's not, I don't think, particularly moved by human interest, it's moved by geopolitical interests. Um, and at the moment, there for, for uh, international tribunals such as the IC ICC or for an ad hoc tribunal to be established, it would require movement in the Security Council, and that is, that is not forthcoming. What we are seeing is that there's been a rebirth in, you know, rebirth, there's been a movement towards um, finding justice, um, sparks of accountability in different um, national jurisdictions. And you can see the emphasis has started to move towards national jurisdictions. The later question is going to be how those national jurisdictions might eventually um, work together with any sort of international mechanism. Yes, I was in uh, Sinjar last year, and Yazda, you saw a lot of Yazda, Murad Ismail, who was heading it, they're the organization who speaks for the Yazidis. And even after the UN Security Council recognized it, um, authorized an investigation into the crimes of genocide, they ran out of money. They were looking hopefully for Dutch lottery funds, coming down to the lottery. And after it had been sanctioned by the UN Security Council. So if they're having trouble, what about you know every other human rights issue? I mean, I think that, first of all, there's a lot of demands on time. I think people don't realize what these activists go through. I mean, you see very clearly what Nadia goes through, but people like Murad, Ahmed, even people from other NGOs like Free Zidi, they have essentially run themselves into ground, scraping dollars everywhere. And I don't think uh, interest and um, following and people caring hasn't necessarily, compassion hasn't translated into funding these organizations, um, and they, s they work really on a shoestring. So, in terms of emotional pressure, there's emotional pressure from all over because their community expects it of them. The international community and people out want to see them, but th that isn't necessarily married with any sort of um, consistent commitment. Tatiana, what, is it getting harder, do you think, to do the kind of fighting that you have to do? Well, when it comes to Ukraine, um, 
we have double-sided story when it comes to our own government. Uh, we still have power to make it work. In, uh, if not, we can make a revolution. <laughs> we did it to two-year revolution in 10 years. Uh, but we do not have any protection for the occupied territories, for illegally annexed Crimea and Donbass, with a huge wave of uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity happening there. And we cannot, the, the mechanisms of international protection of human rights, uh, they uh, do not work there. So uh, all we can do is to uh, make a publicity for these stories and to give a voice to these people that live there. In Crimea, uh, uh, no, nor UN, uh, no OSCE, uh, neither UN nor OSCE uh, are able to work uh, there, there is no any presence of international organizations. Therefore, we as our activists, we collect uh, human rights violations and share it with the uh, governments, with international organizations, and also document uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, send this to the International Criminal Court. There are a number of cases in the European Court for Human Rights, and also uh, it is important to do the work on the national level. And I believe uh, even now, we ca when we don't have any opportunity to, to provide help and assistance to these victims, uh, we have to do everything possible to document and to make international mechanisms to work. And I think we'll one day this all impunity has to stop. So, you, so Ukraine has the problem that they can't get permission for, for international organizations to come to work with uh, Ukrainian organizations like your own. How do you have a problem because for many international organizations they feel it's too dangerous to go to Tripoli where you live. But how important is it now? We saw with, with, with Nadia that she brought in Amal Clooney which helped to make her own voice stronger and, and got more attention. Do you also think that that is the, a way forward? It is a time where the local communities are much stronger. They have their own voice. But does it help to get other stronger voices internationally, even if they can't be present uh, for security reasons, that it amplifies it and actually works against some of the problems we've been discussing? Yeah, I mean, I think the matter is not only about bringing high-level international voices. It's really about the understanding of the international community that wherever they go, they need to have a local partner. They just need to work with local people. And it's very unfortunate to like, and this is something that it's not only my reflection on how the international co wor international community works on Libya, but like I hear this from many like women's rights activists and young people activists from, from different places where the international community and mainly the UN actually have a great influence on their country that when the international community go to places, it it's really sad that I have to say it this way, but it just feels as if they are doing us a favor. Um, as a local person, every time I meet with someone from the international community, I really have to convince them. So I have this person who is a foreigner who's saying that they are coming to support rebuilding my own country, support the political transition, support the peace building process. And yet I have to convince this person of my value. I have to convince them of my value as a local person. I have to convince them of my value as a woman and as a young person. And I think that is a huge problem because as much as the international community, the UN, the international organizations and different international stakeholders says that, you know, we believe in the, in the partnership with local communities, we cannot do anything without local communities, but it doesn't seem that they have a systematic way to do it. I mean, there is all the Security Council resolutions, all the treaties or, you know, the meetings, the conferences, the like everything, when it comes to on paper, everything is there, but when it comes to really implementation, it doesn't seem to be systematic. And perhaps one way, like a reason for that, because I don't think there is also a sense of accountability when it comes to how much the international community is forced to work with local communities. So as I said, it doesn't really- Forced to work? 
Sorry? Forced. They're forced. They don't recognize it? They don't recognize it. No, as I said, I mean, to be completely honest, and this is not something that I'm only saying, I was in a meeting um, two days ago in Finland, and it was about youth peace and security, and there was young people from South Sudan, there was people from Myanmar, and they were saying the exact same thing, that when it comes to international communities' contribution in our countries, it feels as if it's a favor. I told you, it's like, Every time I have to convince these people that, you know, speak to local communities. With my organization, we do a lot of advocacy. This year for 2019, we have four projects running. Every project have an element of advocacy. Believe me, more than 80% of this advocacy goes towards the international community, even more than our national decision makers. Because there is one fact that whether we recognize it or not, the international community contribution in these countries affects the power dynamics on ground, affects it directly. So like if the international community, for instance, is going to design a peace negotiation, it's the international community who invites people to the table. So if the international community will invite men, women, and young people, there is going to be men, women, young people. If they don't, then I, for example, I don't have any access for that. Other people don't have any access for that. And there is always the sense of romanticizing our work as local activists. You know, you, you have this great story of like how you're doing amazing work. Come and speak in this high level meeting for three minutes and then leave. Seriously, I mean, even Nadia was saying, oh, I'm speaking for over three minutes. She's going to cut up my speech. Because, yeah, come and inspire us why we need to discuss your cause, but when we're going to discuss it politically or from an expert's perspective, that's going to happen, like, somewhere else, because what do you really know about it, you know? So it's the problem is that when we talk about local people contribution, it needs to be something systematic. It's nee it needs to be one of the elements, you know? I, I truly agree with this, uh, what you've said. I've seen so often that how quickly in the Yazidi case, for example, how quickly they drop out of being the center of the conversation around events. It starts to be about who's at the events, what do those people need? And, and even in the film, I think we should ask ourselves, were people, was, were people there to hear Nadia or was Nadia there to speak to lobby those people? Um, a lot of the, what you see in the packaging of it, of saying it needs to be three minutes, you need to highlight this, you can't use the word refugee, there are too many refugees. It's because they know they're there to appeal to that audience. And the people who are arranging it, you see, um, and, and this is their job, it's not at all uh, uh, to cast any aspersions on them, but Simone Mondesabian, who's the chief of UNODC, um, she's trying to explain it. The, you need to package it in a way that they can understand these are the points you need to hit. So in a way, yes, Nadia is the center of attention. Nadia, they're here to listen to Nadia. But real in the reality, the actual subtext that matters to those interactions is can Nadia hit all the points to get these people that she's speaking to in the audience to do things? And she's not really the center, in fact. And you see that in a lot of Yazidi events. And, and the one thing I did want to add, we had discussed it earlier, and I did want to make the point that, yes, Nadia is the face and voice of the genocide, along with another, a number of other female survivors. Um, and and she, she draws in a lot of attention, and, and she is used, um, and I use not in a pejorative way, she is used, and she understands, the m she understands herself now. You can see at the end, she's going, don't use imagine. They're not going to imagine. We need to use this verb instead. So you can see she so herself understands the arena that she's entered into. But when you talk about the conversations about what is accountability looking like, what is the future of Sinjar looking like, what are the politics of Iraq going to be to guarantee Yazidi security in Iraq, women are generally not part of those conversations. Those conversations that don't happen in rooms, that don't require three-minute speeches, in which there are no cameras, women are not in those meeting rooms. So there is, I think, a question which is both for the international community and also for the Yazidi community and other survivor communities as to how women are being um, utilized and if they're not actually being given any real power. So they're not like the, the, dis the discussions which do exist about the rebuilding of, of Sinjar, although there's not much money given yet to rebuild no Sinjar in those areas, but the women who suffered the most, and in fact so many men were killed that in places like Kocho, it's only the women survivors who can... Mainly, mainly yes. women, and, and now some the boys who were under 12 at the time survived, and they've gotten a bit older now. Yeah. Um, 
But I mean, it will change. Nadia's now a little bit different after having win, won the Nobel Peace Prize because she's become undeniable as a force. You can't now cut her out. So it, it requires her to be in the room. But that wasn't always true. And often the meetings that are very long, very boring, um, but are the, you know, boring meetings are actually where big decisions get made uh, after uh, a lot of time, a lot of coffee. Um, they, uh, they're, they d they're not in those meetings. They're there to draw in crowds to move the political needle. But when that needle is being moved and they're saying, well, what can we get in the situation? Women are not generally present in those meetings. It's really quite shocking to hear this because you know, I, th I think of the situation, for example, in Afghanistan, which grabbed the world's attention and after the fall of the Taliban, there, so, there was more you know, aid from so many countries around the world. And after 10 years, when it didn't quite work out, that Afghans were disappointed, the international community was disappointed, there was endless meetings, people around the table, all these heads of agencies, and then they would conclude after you know, hours of discussions, we should have listened to Afghans more. And I would say, really? That's your conclusion? They said, yeah, yeah, I think we should listen to Afghans more. This was after a decade. So that was years ago. And to hear you saying that still the lesson is not being learned. Tatiana, for you, I mean, you're in an area, of course, with, over the, with the shadow of Russia. Um, Russia, of course, of occupation of, of Crimea. So the, you know, the West, you know, the big powers are interested in where you are. What is your observations of the engagement and how it helps and how it doesn't help? You know, two the most frequent words we uh, have heard from the international community throughout these five last years were deeply concerned. Everyone was deeply concerned. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there were uh, numerous resolutions, recommendations, etc., etc. But you have to face the country that doesn't uh, follow any resolutions and recommendations. And you know, this is good to tell the stories and at least through these stories uh, show people what is happening, but finally it all ends in numbers. And in Ukraine we have uh, more than 10,000 people being killed in, in a conflict in Donbass and they are still continue to be killed. Several days ago, another person was killed in shelling. But people don't know about it. When I talk to my friends and colleagues from other countries, they are surprised that we still have war in our country. Uh, we have 70 political prisoners on the territory of uh, Russia and Crimea. We have one more than 100 people being kept, uh, being uh, in, in captivity in, do in Donbass people being uh, tortured, a lot of enforced disappearances, etc. Of course, I don't like that, you know, when, I, when I'm when i speaking about this, this is shocking for me. I remember uh, first uh, uh, protester being killed during Euromaidan. I was in The Hague at, the, at that time, and we were trying to, to call all people to from international community to come that day to Kiev to see what is happening. And, you know, I was just... I was so shocked with just with one death, uh, with death of Sergei Nigoyan. He was first, and I was just literally sitting down on the co floor in the corridor and, and crying. And after I had the meetings with diplomats, I was telling them about this story, that they have to, to go immediately, that they have to react. But, you know, everything is not so easy. And then, but then just in, in a half of a year, MH17 was shot down by a missile from the separatist-controlled territory I in Ukraine with many Dutch citizens on board. It's, I'm trying to explain that it's all interconnected. You cannot just uh, st be aside because once uh, it, it will touch you personally. And I think this is very important message to tell people. Uh, that we have all these destinies, we have to stop it. Once we not, we don't reach this goal, this will repeat again and again. And I think my country did big mistake when, for example, the military, uh, the, the aggression trap uh, uh, happened to Georgia, when the it was case in Moldova and Transnistria, we were not reacting, we were just being aside and trying to make good relations and business with our friend Russia, and now we are now victims by ourselves. We 
every country has to react to, to all these violations of international law. Uh, because uh, ne the next day, uh, every everyone can be on the place of that victim. Yes, I mean, you underline the fundamental point. We live in a world where, thanks to technology, the ease of travel, social media, we should be pulling together, closer together, but uh, it seems we still keep pulling even further apart. I want to begin bring all of you into the conversation now, and we have some roving microphones, I understand, yes. Um, please raise your hand and say who you are, and let's see if we have a comment or a question, not long, but... So thank you very much for your intervention. I think it's really inspiration and uh, in a day as today, and um, also the documentary. I've uh, listened to you, I've uh, seen the documentary, and I've listened to Mr. Villani, and all of you are speaking about the international mechanism and um, how to raise like civil society, how to raise states to do something that can change the situation. As the last year, we were like speaking a lot about the global compact of migration and the global compact of, of refugees. <laughs> I am wondering, which is your opinion about uh, the, the, in, like, uh, the implied uh, implementation of these uh, compacts that are done to mitigate the suffering of, of refugees and legal and Ill illegal uh, migrants? And uh, if you do think that, uh, that, make, that would make a difference think like a, you know like a like a really a method a, a mechanism to yes. change yes because at the, the last hour many world powers pulled out of it but it still was passed as a kind of a new guide to how there's a one pact on refugees and one pact on migration so that the world could have a collective response to because like Tatiana said it doesn't just affect one country it's really uh, something which affects the entire the entire community I don't know whether any of you, of course, Libya is very much involved in the migration crisis with Europe making deals with, with Libya. Is, I mean, you're absolutely right. These kind of new treaties, pacts, people coming together, like it's like the Climate Change Pact and others, to try to work on these collectively should be a solution, but often it's watered down or people pull out. Yes, um, I don't know if this will speak specifically to a question, but about the Yazidis, the issue of um, going abroad is actually a very difficult issue, and you see them touch upon it in the uh, in the documentary as to whether they stay in Sinjar or whether they go away. And, and there's one one um, gentleman who's in a crowd who goes, "If five go there and two go theirs, we'll become extinct." For the Yazidis, both parents have to be Yazidi for the child to be Yazidi. It's a, a very insular community. It's very vulnerable to genocide. But that is the unless the religious authorities come out with a path to conversion or recognize children of mixed marriages, that is. Uh, that remains the case. Um, and so if Yazidis are split up and some go to Canada, some go to Germany, it actually it proposes a very existential threat to them. So the question of do they leave or do they stay is not just a question of security, it's really a question of existence. So it's, it's not necessarily a simple, simple question for the Yazidis. Ajit, do you have a comment on the, the international pacts to try to deal with these, prob with these, pr with these problems? Ajit, yeah. I mean, um, I'm not sure I will uh, touch upon like the specific acts in particular, um, but you've mentioned, for an example, um, the interest around Libya right now when it comes to stopping immigration. And I personally find it very ironic because, I mean, it's a post-conflict country, hashtag ongoing conflict, hashtag <laughs> everything else. And I find it very significant in an ironic way that the EU would like consider that Libya is a safe place, safe enough place for you know, 
for other people to be relocated there. And I think this gives like a very interesting sense because I mean, many of the European countries and, and different countries around the world um, advise their own citizens to not go to Libya. Um, so what is this double standard? I mean, is it not safe for you, but it's safe for someone else to stay there? And I think that says a lot about it. Um, but I think what's what was being brought up a lot um, in the movie, but also in our discussion, is the reference to the international community. Um, and I find that very interesting because you talk about it, everyone talks about it, but then it seems from the international community perspective, as I said, it's like it's more of like we're doing something good to these other people. And to be completely honest, at least from the experience of Libya, no, you're not doing something good. If you're doing anything at all, then it's because of your responsibility. Um, when the war started in Libya, I was studying medicine and I volunteered to work at the hospital. And it was very interesting to see that the first patient I met, it wasn't a young man injured in the battlefields as we saw in the media. It was an old man who was in a coma for a few months because he was injured from an airstrike on his way to the grocery store. And that man passed away a few days after I started. And his son, I remember it very clearly, he was in the room cr crying saying, what did we do to them? And at that time I was like, them, who's them? And now I know what we're talking about because it's it's because of this interconnectivity. Um, there is no Libyans and others anymore. There is no one nation and others. There is them, there is the international community. And if they're going to do anything, it's because of their responsibility to do something. It's not anymore, you know, the goodwill of the people to help other people, no. Thank you. Right here. We have the microphone on this side. Uh, oh, hi. All right. Okay. You, you're next. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi. With a nice hat. Okay. Yes. Hi. My name is Karen. I'm a journalist, and I a few years ago I launched an organization to support women journalists. And um, a lot of the time, is it too loud? Is it okay? Is it better? Okay. Um, my question was basically, um, you know, as a journalist myself, I've spent uh, almost two decades doing, uh, you know, reporting myself and then eventually ended up forming an organization to support women journalists because we, you know, end up working in, uh, you know, like I guess we become activists when we cover many causes and all of that. And I think a lot of uh, the theme of what came up today was um, lack of, there, there's a disengagement between resources and people who are doing the good work, um, activism and people who are working on the ground for the uh, for human rights and all of that, and then people who have the resources who can give those resources. So my question was, have uh, have you figured out or you have ideas where how to get those resources? Um, yes, there is a disconnect, but have you found? Um, a way to maneuver that, and if there's something that you can share about that, how to bring the resources to do the good work that you want to do in your countries or for human rights. I'm, I'm a former journalist by myself, um, and I, I remember that time very well. Um, I covered a lot of stories that were connected to different human rights violations unfair justice, torture cases. As we have a kind of freedom of speech in our country, it was possible to tell all of that, but we have a totally dysfunctional system of justice. And when I met people after that, um, after a year when I published a story, I think in a normal country, just publicizing it, it will cause some investigation and uh, bringing perpetrators to uh, responsibility, but it never happened. So I one, one day I just uh, uh, took a banner and uh, went to the general prosecutor's office and stand a, as an activist. And then I understand I'm not a journalist anymore. But um, I think that resource is uh, a mo mobilization of the people. Uh, and this is a case for my country uh, where we, with the beginning of crisis, we've got a very big uh, movement of volunteers, many people who never ever 
participated in any kinds of uh, social life or public activity like school teachers or nurses or businessmen. Uh, they, uh, I think it was cause of crisis, but uh, we have now 1.5 million internally displaced persons who moved mainly from Donbass and partially from Crimea. And uh, at the first year of the war, our army was uh, totally also dysfunctional. It was destroyed uh, by corruption through many decades and we were like people united to protect, uh, to, to even <laughs> to provide food for our army because we didn't have even good food first year. So I think, and this energy, uh, it helps. And this is also a case for Crimea. This is interesting because uh, during the first year of occupation, a lot of uh, independent journalists, human rights defenders, a lot of my colleagues uh, left Crimea. Uh, and there were tot civil society was totally destroyed there. But now people uh, are getting used to, to live under the pressure and we see the new grassroots of civil society. Some bloggers, that uh, citizen journalists that work in a situation when there is no professional journalist almost. Uh, uh, initiatives like Crimean Solidarity, Crimean Tatar movement that support uh, uh, not only Crimean Tatar uh, families of political prisoners, but also others. And this is uh, something that gives hope and that shows that even uh, that under this big pressure, people can uh, mobilize and unite. And this is a very big source that we have to use. I think it is the most important source. If there's any people who are Yazidi in the audience, I do encourage you if you'd like to ask a question. But there's a lady over here now. Huh? Yeah. Hi, and thank you for your presentation. I think it's very moving. So I'm sorry, my voice is trembling because I'm myself a refugee. I've been in Switzerland now for 25 years. Um, through my work, I was uh, working as a humanitarian now for 20 years. I just come back from Cox Bazaar when I've seen the women Rohingya uh, suffering, many of them have been raped. And now listen to your story, I've lived in Iraq for two years as well, and originally I'm from Kosovo. Mm -hmm. What makes me angry is to see this pattern of why women, why they are constantly the one who are suffering, the one they are raped, the one they are used as the main weapon actually. For, 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 for everything that the, the man can do actually, I know this impunity and but the women are the one who are the most facing. And rarely we hear talking about that. And what strikes me, and through my work and my personal life, is that the women are the one who are being the new generation, building the new generation. I'm talking specifically about my country, and I've seen in Iraq as well. The new generation are the one who needs to be educated. Well, let's say the freedom, or let's say to be to know how the pe how to live in the peace and how to be open-minded. But that's not the case because through the suffering of their mothers, of their sisters, of their grandmothers, it's not possible. So we are losing generations. So my question is specifically to you. I see many women being activists, but how does how does that let's say? Um, translate into your words? How is your voice, let's say, louder? Or how do you feel about that? Because what I see, it's the man, and I, I attended this, uh, the lunch day, I mean, the lunch today, another beautiful presentation where we're saying the world needs to change. I mean, it's not just about the world, the, p the countries in the world, but it's just about every other countries in the world, that the mindset has to change because those who are making the taking decision are still men. Mm -hmm. And the one who are talking and who are suffering, I, I, I can see and I can say are women. But what about that? So that, that is something that we need to change and we need to contribute. Otherwise, I see things will not just in remaining, as you said, impunity actually. Mm -hmm. And that is perpetrating. And more and more, just to add another thing, we're talking about the, the, the rape which is something that we have never talked before, actually. So now more and more, everybody's been voicing out about the, the rape specifically. But still, there's nothing done about that specifically. So thank you very much. I just wanted to share thank this. Thank you for sharing that. What's your name? Pitore. Pitore. Happy International Women's Day, Pitore. 
Oh, Hodger. Yeah, she just sat, or so, Sarita, you were, you were nodding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, sp I spend, a, I have a, a particular focus on the gendered commission and impact of crimes. And I think in many ways you're right. right. I mean, when perpetrators commit crimes, they often, uh, the crimes are committed and directed towards um, women and men, boys and girls differently by reason of their gender. And that's done by design because to attack a community, you leverage um, pre-existing structural inequalities, pre-existing prejudices, uh, and you can see that in uh, in both the they you can see that it's a part of the design. And so you see women because men are more likely to be targeted as killings, and there's lots of reasons for that, including to send a message of dominance to the other community. But women and girls tend to be, and and this is not universally true, of course, because there are men who also suffer non-killing crimes, including sexual violence. That isn't often adequately recognized as well. Um, so even in our understanding of crimes, we're very also draw upon quite, stere quite stereotypical um, understandings. So while many men are killed, many men, many men also aren't killed, and, and the, the, men, the crimes that they are subject to, the violations they are subject to, aren't necessarily recognized. But for women, it's true that women tend to be subjected to a larger number of, a, a larger span of violations committed over a much longer period of time. Um, and even in the case of women who are killed, they tend to be killed in very um, specific ways in relation to their gender. So for example, in Myanmar, where you see at Cox's Bazaar, there is some reporting on women being killed with instruments that have been used to kill cattle. Um, in Rwanda and in Myanmar, you had women di dying through um, um, mutilation of the breasts and genitals, for example. So there are very specific ways that women are killed that you don't necessarily always see in the way that men are killed. The one thing that you also do see is that women, when women are subjected to a range of non-lethal violations, that there is a, an almost focus um, on sexual violence to the, ex to the exclusion of understanding the other crimes, even with Nadia Murad. Nadia Murad was subjected to a range of crimes and enslavement being distinct from sexual enslavement as well, but their focus has been on, and, and you see that in the reporting on Myanmar, there's a huge focus on um, sexual violence rather and not looking at a other crimes, but also how sexual violence operates as part of an action to target this group or to um, de destroy either the individual or, or the group in the cases of genocide. So there's, um, there's, there's, there's a very reductive approach to and very gendered approach to understanding crimes, which is not always very helpful. And Hadjir, we talked earlier on about how in 2011, when the uprising in Libya first started, you saw in Tripoli and Benghazi, women did, did play a big role, but then we saw how gradually they withdrew from the public space. Sadly, some were, were murdered, but some said that they were squeezed out by the men. Now, you set up this organization, and you know, together we build it, you know, to promote the participation of women and girls. Are you finding that you're able to open up that space more for women to play a, a bigger role? Okay. I'm going to say something very provocative, but uh, since it's Women's Day, I will <laughs> take it for Wouldn't granted. Wouldn't expect anything else, right? not sure. <laughs> But it was interesting when you were saying that we need to change the system and the system that we should change, it's uh, something me and my friends call it the straight men disorder, where it's, yes, it exists. <laughs> um, where, as you said, you see women on the ground, on all levels actually, doing doing 50%, maybe even more of the work, but then when it comes to representation, or like, you know, these small rooms with the tables where decisions are being made, they are not there. Um, at the Together We Build It organization, which I co-founded, we very proudly say we are an intergenerational organization, means we have different generations, and we work on encouraging women and young people to participate in formal and non-formal peace building. So one of our young girls, she's 15 years old, and she was talking about one of the peace talks that was happening on the international uh, level, more or less, and she was like, that looks like the naughty boys table. Which, which it is, which it is. <laughs> and I mean, if I'm gonna follow like the same tone that she spoke with, you know, naughty boys do not behave. So maybe include women and young people so they can, they can well behave because like, it's just so ridiculous to still see the international community and I'm still gonna blame the international community whenever they want to 
make an initiative, then they need to be responsible for that. Like last year, there were so many international initiatives on Libya to bring the different political actors together. And there was one of them where like all what you can see is a president of one of the European countries and you see four Libyan men. And I was just thinking like seriously, like you have a country, a whole country of six million people and you really think it's represented by these four Libyan men, like four men. And I mean, you cannot blame the Libyans, to be entirely honest. I mean, I'm not saying we are the most gender equal country in the world, far away from that. But I mean, this is an initiative by a European country. So it's like, it's the president who sent out the invitation. So it's not hard to think that, you know, the same as what you wish for your own country, where you have all of these quotas, where you have 50-50 gender representation in your government, and you're super proud of that. Why wouldn't you do the same thing to other countries? So, straight mm -hmm. men disorder, yeah. fight <laughs> it. <laughs> um, excuse me. Yeah, right in the middle, as she should be. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my name is Adiba, I am a Yazidi, and I am a survivor from the genocide in the 2014, but I was luckier than Nadia Murad. I have survived 15 minutes before ISIS arrived in my village, and I lost 70 members of my family. So I just want to, I mean, I don't have a question, but I just, I just want to add some, some, uh, some uh, points. I mean... I was 10 years old when Saddam Hussein was gone, and I remember even when we had peace in our country before he was gone, we never had right. I mean, as a Yazidi community and Yazidi woman, we never, never had right. We were not recognized. We were, I mean, even our, our mother tongue, we were not able to, to, to talk. You know, our mother tongue was not recognized. Me, I am 25 years old, and in my community, I was the first generation who could go to school. I mean, and in 2014, I mean, how to say, 3,000 women, I mean, in front of all the world have got raped and killed, and it's, it's still ongoing. I mean, uh, Barouche, Syria, for example, it's, it's almost like liberated, it's almost finished, but where are the women? Where are those children, you know? and. I'm sorry, but no matter how much we talk, I don't think that, that there is people who can listen to us. There is the people who could change or who could give us the, their hand because it's, it's since four years, nothing has been done. And all those survivors who, who came back, they are in the camps and every month we have cases of, of uh, suicide. They are killing themselves because we don't have any support, we don't have psych psychological support. And even for the healthy women who were not raped, they cannot, th they cannot raise their voice, they cannot say what happened. For example, me, I was an activist and I was telling the world what is happening to us when I was working with media. But I had to run from my country because I was saying the reality, because I was saying what happened to my people, because I was saying we were not protected. And that's why I am a refugee today in, in, in Switzerland, where we say it's the capital of human rights. This is one year and two months that I am in this country, and I am not recognized as a refugee. They still don't give me the permission. And last year, when I was uh, invited by the government to, to make my interview and to tell them the reasons that I am a refugee and I'm a here, I am here in Switzerland, they were asking me why I am here, why I am applying for the asylum. I say, well, I lost my family, I had to flee home, I lost 70 members of my family, and then my job was to, to, uh, to document the mass graves, and then I had political issues, and because I was, I was a woman, and because I was free, I had to, to flee my country. The government asked me, is this enough reasons to apply for the asylum in our country? So, and, 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 and at that time, they kept, they kept me eight hours in the meeting and they were asking me questions like that. I mean, and I don't have hope, I'm sorry to say that. I really, I don't believe in government and I don't believe in what they call human rights. Yeah, unfortunately, mm. yeah. Adiba, thank you for sharing your story. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeannie Millet. <laughs> But 
and a human rights festival should not be without hope. So let me introduce you to 25-year-old Adiba, who I had the pleasure of meeting here in Geneva a few months ago. And if I did remember your story right, and it's an unforgettable story, she's never had a day of formal schooling in her life. She was not allowed to be schooled because she was considered stateless as a child. So deprived of going to school, Adiba taught herself at home through primary school, through high school, but then never had a, a day of formal schooling, Adiba is now a student at the University of Geneva, and she is also a fellow of one of your leading security think tanks. So I give you Adiba. <laughs> I think it would be wrong. I don't want to end this first evening of this great Geneva Film Festival on a, a note that things are, are wrong, that we can't get it right. So I'm gonna to turn to my panel now to think of ways that it can work better. That local activists, and that is one of the strengths of this time, I think we do have to look for what is good in the time in which we live, is that there are people working in the region, from the region, who know the region, and it's just how, are the, there's better pieces, it's just how to make the pieces fit together better. Hodger, what would you, you say would be your advice would be, because I think everyone should leave tonight with a bit of constructive advice. <laughs> be nice, they're from Geneva, really. <laughs> yeah, you really do have good chocolate, so <laughs> I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I really wish if I was asked this question bec before the documentary, because then I can like overcome my own disappointment. But, but after seeing the documentary, I think, I mean, h having having all of, of you in the room, I think it's a sign, and, and it says says a lot, you know. And and we should not really forget about like the power of individual acts as well, because I think this is a time of the world where it's not enough to be a good person anymore you know like you're very good deep down here no 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 it's the time to be actively good and actively good through politics actively good through doing anything so you were saying you lost faith in governments and and you know all of this field but i think it's very important to not lose faith at least in the concept of um, like multilateral work as well because we at some point the world reached to an okay place um, and now we're shifting a bit far away and and I think we just I mean we just need to stick together um, as I said either through politics either through working together either through you know do do anything that will do good so like if if I will be forced to say that I'm hopeful today <laughs> then I'll say I'm hopeful for like with the people that I see and you know all the different activists all the different people who are really working together to make a difference and and I I hope it will work well I really do so I'm not going to sit here and force you to say something so now I'm going to say if you're not forced to be hopeful what would you say <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, I, I had a really good friend of mine who was an activist, um, his name Taufiq Ben Saud. Um, you know a lot about Libya, most probably you've heard of his name. He was actually assassinated in 2014. Um, he was from Benghazi, a city in the east. And I remember in 2014, there was like a war taking place in Tripoli and a war taking place in Benghazi. And one day he called me because he wanted to ask me like to write a joint article with him about the importance of the role of women and young people in peace building. And I remember I was telling him on the phone while hearing like backlashes um, um, in the background. Um, and I said, Tofik, I mean, let's, let's be honest, what would an article do? And he said, you know, Hajar, civic work should never stop. Only the war should stop. And I'm not forced to say that, but, but I think he's absolutely right because he's definitely one of the examples. No wonder, um, no wonder why he was killed. No wonder why an armed group looked at him as a threat because he was like the true example of like civic work should never stop. Only the war should stop at whatever consequences it is. That's good, good advice. Tatiana, do you have a message here for these good people who've joined us tonight? 
you know, spending a lot of times in different international organizations, I always think, do I spend my time in vain? Because you, you are always have a lot of things to do in your country, and you, when you don't feel that instant results, uh, it's difficult. But I think, w we of course, we have to make international mechanisms work, but at the same time, as a citizens of our country, at least if we live at democratic or semi-democratic countries where some influence is possible on authorities, we have to make them work as citizens, as civil society. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, as I mentioned, we have a big problem with big number of IDPs, but still we have discrimination of these people. They cannot vote, for example, at the local election. Maybe authorities wait that they will come back one day, or I don't know what is the reason. We, we still have problem with providing a refugee status for many people that come to our country. For people that come from Russia, for their support of Ukraine, for their critics of Putin regime, and these people cannot receive a refugee status in Ukraine, and that is a shame for us, for our government, and we have to make them uh, to respect their international obligations and not to step aside when they see conflicts in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Um, I just want to first say something to Adiva, if you don't mind being singled out in the audience, and we have, uh, yeah. have a good friend in common, so I feel a bit like I, I know you. <laughs> um, that I, I was in the camps a week, week and a half ago, and I, I actually met uh, one person that I had interviewed two years ago, and it's true, her, her situation wasn't very different, and sometimes I, I feel that strongly, that we're, I don't know what's changing, and I'm not sure what's changing, but I, I also feel that I know there are so many um, Yazidi activists and Yazidi uh, people who are donating, giving their time and working, and as well as non-Yazidis who are their allies who are working with them. And my hope is, and it's still, I think, a hope rather than a concrete fact, my hope is that all the little steps we're making and the pushes we're making, it's not going to be one big leap forward where you say, okay, now this huge thing has happened. At least I don't think so. But my hope is that over time we'll push forward bit by bit, and at some point we'll look behind us and go, all right, we've, we've come so much further than we thought we were going to. For people who aren't, um, who aren't uh, in the region and who aren't directly working on things, I would say I'd echo what Hadra said, which is, you know, it's not enough to be compassionate at anymore. I don't know if it e ever was enough to be compassionate. It's, it's, it's uh, time to educate oneself before acting, but, you know, find out a bit more about it, speak to people who know, read, read stuff that's already done, and then act. I think um, I'd also say, to be honest, donate. Like, oh, it's really great. I don't personally, you know, don't, it's, I think what internationals who aren't, don't have particular expertise and don't have a particular knowledge of the region can do, that's really helpful, is actually to donate. And I would also say um, that violence, whether it's in peacetime in somewhere like Sinjar or s somewhere very peaceful like Geneva, it runs along the lines of structural inequalities in the society. That's why you see these Yidis being targeted. These Yidis are, uh, ethno-religious minority, they have always been stigmatized and marginalized, they have been vectors, um, f they have uh, had violence um, waged against them in peacetime and wartime in Iraq. And that's, I think, you're also true in every society where there are marginalized um, individuals, whether it's LGBT community, women, um, the disabled, they, violence um, courses towards them and it's heightened in times of instability. So I would encourage people to actually get involved in their own place on a local level because my view is that if you start being political and you start taking action, that starts to spread in different parts of your life and it also enables you to have skills and understanding that you can use when you're looking at contexts which are not your own. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we all shared tonight an extraordinary experience in hearing such a powerful story about a, a very unique community and a community which feels profoundly threatened and has been threatened and has been the target of genocide. And we also heard a lot about a very courageous individual. And each one of you here will, I'm sure, take something away from this film and from our discussion tonight. But perhaps one thing is that 
What Nadia Murad tells us is that no despite all that she has been through, she hasn't given up. So whatever you do, however big or small, don't give up. And please thank our guests. Tatiana, Sarita, and Adjur.